All right. Hello, Internet. In case you are unfamiliar, I am a science fiction author. My name is Chase Randolph. I was traditionally published in September of 2020, but because of market problems during COVID, the small press I was with shut down. By April of 2022, they were no more. I am now on the cusp of self-publishing my book. There will be links down in the video description to my website, newsletter, hate feed, and our community Discord server called The Drop Box. Please come hang out if you're interested. Subscribe to the newsletter. Stay up to date on the pending release second edition of my book and its many yet unseen but already completed sequels. Regardless, thanks for being here. Uh, if you're new to the channel and want to see more science explanation videos like this one or just regular gameplay please subscribe to the channel give me a like if you think this topic is interesting and feel free to drop a comment about it if you have questions or comments that's what the comment section is there i always feel silly making these kinds of plugs but i kind of have to it helps the algorithm youtube is weird like that anyway i'm here not to talk so much about my books the focus of this episode is about some of the science inside the science fiction. I am, for lack of a better way to put it, I'm a nerd. And this is one of the big parts of why I write and why I prefer science fiction over my first love, fantasy. Don't get me wrong, I like fantasy. But I love the science, the realness inside the science fiction. So in today's discussion, we're going to talk about a concept known as the Fermi Paradox. Now, in the background, you can see some of my gameplay footage from MechWarrior 5, which, to the, the extent of my knowledge, is the latest and greatest game set in the Battletech universe. This selection is not without reason. In the early 2000s, I discovered Battletech, or rather, it was shown to me by my father, who played the tabletop game in the 80s and or 90s. While I've never played the tabletop game, I love the premise, the universe. I've read a few of the paperbacks, picked up a few of the game books, read a lot of the wiki, all in deep into the lore of the Battletech universe. Because after all, who doesn't love big stompy robots? But around this same time, some of the other stuff I was getting into, you know, some of the other sci-fi classics in gaming, really got me thinking. Um, the two games that most immediately come to mind are Halo 2 and the first Mass Effect game. So while I was reading lore and tabletop rules and doing die rolls to randomly generate my player characters from tables in these games, in these books that are older than I am, I was playing these other games full of aliens. So naturally, it wasn't long before I was wondering if humans in Battletech have jump ships and faster than light travel spread across such a large chunk of the galaxy and colonized hundreds, if not thousands of planets, why didn't they find any aliens? Now, there are actually mentions of aliens in the game and the lore, but they're all animals, giant lizards that can be ridden like horses, or predatory animals like super cats that might hunt your men down you know, if they're on foot in the jungles of this planet. That, something along those lines. So, sure, there's aliens, but none of it is intelligent alien life. It's not another culture out there like the Covenant or Krogan or whoever your go-to alien example of civilization is. Nothing else out there is building cities or traveling between planets. Believe it or not, this is part of why I started writing science fiction. The first trilogy of books I wrote back in the 2006-2010-ish time frame, shortly after I was getting super nerdy about Battletech, were set in the Battletech universe. For lack of a better term, I cringe as I say this, they were fantastic. But I added aliens into it. Nasty aliens, bent on galactic genocide that built even better Gauss rifles. In short, Battletech is the reason I asked the question, where are the aliens? Which is essentially the Fermi paradox. To try and answer that question is why I started writing science fiction. So both this franchise, and this topic, this genre, are of personal significance to me. Now, I know 
I should get to the topic at hand and not just rant about how I got to this topic. So, the Fermi Paradox can be summarized, as I just said, with where are the aliens? Now, I was not familiar with any of the science or the discussion about the science at the time, nor did I know that it was even a thing. I arrived at this question independently. I was just a nerd in a small town with a few too many colorful books from my TV's tabletop games, Xbox, and like I didn't even have internet. It wasn't a thing that I could just go look up on my own, so I had no way of knowing. On the odd occasion when I did have internet access, you know, the 2006-ish internet was very different from the internet we have now. You know, that was far enough back we had classics like Filthy Frank and FPS Rush. To elaborate a little more on my Where Are the Aliens summary of the Fermi Paradox. The Fermi Paradox is named after the scientist Enrico Fermi. He was born in 1901, died in 1954. Enrico Fermi was an Italian-born American who helped build Chicago Pile No. 1, which was the name of the first nuclear reactor, and he was a contributing member of the Manhattan Project. You know, if my memory serves, this first reactor was used to refine the 235 into weapons grade that was later used in the nuclear weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, eventually ended the Second World War. This paradox is named after him because it was he who originally posed the question in a succinct manner like this in the 1950s, while discussing the general topic with fellow scientists Edward Teller, Herbert York, and Emil Konopinski, I think that's how I say his name, spelled K-O-N-O-P-I-N-S-K-I, if you want to look him up. Anyway, after the advent of nuclear weapons and nuclear power, these scientists were contemplating faster than light travel and you know, the other potential eventualities of this nuclear technology. And these great minds asked something along the lines of, where is everyone? Because if there were technologies as powerful as nuclear fusion, why had other alien races not discovered them, developed them too? But this is even more complex of a question than just where are the aliens? Because we have to ask when are the aliens? Because this is where light speed comes into the equation. And by light speed, I mean the speed of light. There are billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, much less the entire universe. With so many stars, there's a non-zero possibility that some of these stars have planets, and that these planets would fall in the habitable Goldilocks zone, and some of those planets would have life, and some of that life would be intelligent. And then, on top of that, you remember the speed of light? For reference, it's about 300,000 kilometers per second, or 186,000 miles per second, if you're like me and still think in freedom. Anyway, because of the age of the galaxy and the speed of light propagation from all of these stars to planets, we can essentially look backwards in time, because, arbitrarily, if a star is 1,400 light years distant from us, that means the light we're seeing from it today left it 1,400 years ago. That light, that information, is 1,400 years old. Meaning, we can deduce from this that not only are there no intelligent interplanetary civilizations in the galaxy, there are, and as we can tell, never have been any either. The Milky Way is about 13 billion, with a B, 13 billion years old. And we can see light from all kinds of distances, all kinds of ages back in time. That's a lot of time for something somewhere to get smart. Now, I have done videos before on this topic, and it was years ago. The audio quality was bad, and they had watermarks, and the video was lower quality, and it was awful. And that's why I'm redoing it now. But one of the points I used before to help illustrate this discussion was radio signals. Because radio signals propagate at the same speed as light. We, as humans, have had functioning radios long before we even got off Earth. We've had functioning radios for about 100 years. I know, that's not an exact number. 
a little more than that, but we're just doing math on napkins here. Bear with me. 100 years of radio signal propagation from our earliest radio transmissions means that those early signals are about 100 light years from Earth now. So, hypothetically, anyone with a radio receiver within a 100 light year radius sphere of Earth should be able to pick up those signals and trace them back to Earth. And this kind of thing works both ways. Anyone else out there who has something as basic as a radio is going to be emitting light speed radio signals too. And we haven't found it. Because of the size of the galaxy, any radio signals from planets coming from far away are going to take a long time to get here. From our example star that's 1400 light years away, it's going to take 1400 years for those radio signals to reach us too. In that way, distant stars are kind of like time travel. The light you see in the night sky right now is hundreds, thousands, possibly even millions of years old, depending on you know how far away the star is coming from is. And radio signals are going to work in much the same way, letting us, in effect, see backwards in time. And despite us looking backwards in time, there's no other life out there, or at least no life intelligent enough to build radios powerful enough for us to have detected them yet. And there's a lot of stars. Any of those stars may have one or more planets. Any of those planets may or may not be Earth. -like. I mean, again, you know, the Milky Way is billions of years old, and you want me to believe that no planet at any time has ever generated intelligent life. And therein lies the paradox. Because statistically speaking, with so many stars, so many planets, over so long a time span, and yet there's no intelligent life, no galaxy-wide empires, no radio signals, no hostile takeovers from foreign planets, not even leftover signs of their past existence, like the paperclip maximizer mentioned in the previous discussion episode. Nothing, just silence and void. So again, I ask, where? are the aliens. That's my quick and dirty explanation for what the Fermi Paradox is, putting it in conversational terms so we can have a conversation about it. Please feel free to throw a comment down in the comment section, I'd love to chat there, or if you want to join our Discord server, the Dropbot, we can talk there. Our growing community talks about nerd stuff all the time. Lately it's been 1940s battleships, but we can always change the topic. This conversation is a lot more complex than just where are the aliens. There are things like the filters, for example, which in simple, simple terms, a filter is a reason for a specific life form that, you know, to or to not to grow intelligent into a radio transmitting space traveling civilization. Filters of varying degrees of severity, locally broken down into great filters, minor focus. An example, take dolphins. They're smart, maybe even human level smart, but because they live underwater, they'll probably never discover fire, and without fire, they'll probably never discover metallurgy, and never build rockets, and never get off the planet. Regardless of high level intelligence or not, that's probably a great filter. A minor filter would be something with less extreme of an effect. Like, a hypothetical creature is living on a planet at the outer edge of its star's Goldilocks zone. And it has longer, harsher winters. These animals are less likely to survive the winter. Less likely to devote resources to other things besides surviving the winter. Like engineering and building spaceships. It won't stop them from becoming an interstellar race, but that kind of living in heart mode is going to make it a little less likely that they do. And then, you know, just about everything can be broken down into a filter in one way or another. Perhaps it's a great filter to not be, you know, not create viable interstellar travel without nuclear fusion power technology. But then, you have to get past the filter of not using that nuclear technology to blast yourself back into the Stone Age and murder everyone with a radiation because of petty political differences. Now, these kinds of filters, while related to the Fermi Paradox, are not the purpose of this episode. 
I'm just here to make sure we're aware of the Fermi Paradox, not to pull down the filter rabbit hole. That is potentially a different topic for a different episode. This time, we're just focusing on the Fermi Paradox. That states, by way of statistics, there are too many planets that have existed for too long a time, around too great a number of stars, for us humans to have been the first intelligent life to develop sufficiently to be broadcasting signals off of our planet, all by ourselves. And yet we can't find any evidence of anyone else having come before with us. And if they had faster than light travel technology equipment, then distance wouldn't matter at all. And yet there's no galaxy-wide empire. This discussion about filters is more an extension of the idea, going into the possible reasons that there are no aliens and how we can avoid these filters ourselves. And you know, more of a manifest destiny for all of humanity grow and expand and inhabit all the stars. But that's going to get a little too whimsical. Thanks for your time for stopping by to chat. I look forward to hearing from you, and I'll see you in the next video. Hardy hardy, nerds.